Hello and welcome to the Proyaki Record. I'm Michael Westbay, your host. This is episode 2, dated January 6th, 2013. I'd like to lead off this second episode with a question from Bradley Woodrum. He asks, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about starting the NPB season in the U.S. Selfishly, I think that sounds awesome. But I also think TV ratings and attendance might be tricky, since the NPB is not terribly popular here in America. I imagine some location along the West Coast wouldn't have attendance and ratings issues, though. Uh, this, of course, he I had mentioned in the January 1st episode last week. Um, and it was kind of a follow-up to a Patrick Newman post to the Google Plus ProYaku community, where newman son pointed out that Commissioner Cotto had said that he wanted to open the 2014 season in North America, to which uh, Nichan, a popular Japanese um, forum site here in Japan, basically exploded with a lot of negative comments saying, that isn't going to happen. I agree with uh, Woodrum's son. I think that would be awesome. I think it would be really good for Japan to start to expand their brand into not only North America, but as I've said in the past, uh, throughout the Pacific, namely Korea, Taiwan, China, and perhaps even um, Australia. So um, my initial reaction to that was probably a little overly optimistic. Um, fortunately, though, Newman's son pointed out that uh, travel for a regular season series, even an extended one, might be a little too complicated. So, after a little bit of reflection, I think that I've come to the conclusion that, yes, like uh, many of the people on Nichan, opening day is by 2014 is probably a bit too soon. So, how can we get to having an opening day for NPB in North America? I think that it's going to have to start with holding, um, or I think that it's going to have to start with broadcasting NPB games worldwide. That is, North America. The um, Many people can view uh, NPB games via Justin TV, but the real, let's say, legitimate methods of viewing NPB games are still very difficult to use um, and tend to be blocked outside of Japan. So these barriers are going to have to come down. They're going to have to come down someday anyway. They don't really have any effect to in against anybody who really wants to watch NPB, but making things harder to watch is not going to promote Japanese baseball in North America. Making everything easier, getting on a North American network, um, even a cable network, is going to do a lot more for expanding uh, NPB, that is Nippon Professional Baseball, throughout North America and the world. That's just what's going to have to happen. And the current um, bottleneck is, of course, the owners. See, whereas in North America, in or Major League Baseball controls the broadcast rights for all of the teams. They're all gathered into one organization in order to distribute the rights. In Japan, it doesn't work that way. One would have to make an agreement with each of the 12 Japanese teams in order to have, um, well, in order to secure broadcast rights for Japanese games. And this 
makes it extremely difficult for anybody who wishes to put on a network in North America. So until these kind of things can be worked around or until these stupid rules run by the dinosaurs are changed, I don't really see anything happening soon. So my recommendation to the commissioner is that he really needs some power. You see, the Japanese commissioner is powerless compared to the owners, and the owners are not willing to give up any rights. So until the commissioner actually has some power, I don't see NPB being able to start getting... um, broadcasts in North America, which will be able to lead to a potential opening day, maybe a decade down the line, if they start getting the groundwork running soon. Not very likely. Batting second this week is Clint Holsey. I hope I got that name right. Hulsey-san has been posting several very interesting blog posts about uh, Nigun prospects. His first one was on December 26th, and he's posted two more this past week to the Google Plus ProYaku uh, community. Um, the originals are all on his blog, IRFast. Nonetheless, Hulsey writes um, in one of his pote- in one of his blog posts that um, home runs are very rare in the Western League, and this got me to thinking. You know, I didn't really have an impression that home runs were rather rare at Nigun. In fact, I thought that home runs were inflated at Nigun. Nigun being the farm team. Um, But then I might be skewed by the fact that I have Yokosuka Stadium nearby, and the only Nigun games I really go watch are in Obama nearby. So, and Yokosuka Stadium is, I think, 92 meters down the lines, which is much smaller than the Ichigun stadiums. Also, the stadium fence itself is only a couple meters high, so it's a bit of a hitter's park, I would say. So when um, Holsey-san said this, I thought that maybe he didn't quite have the numbers right, or... Maybe the Western League has larger Nigun parks than the Eastern League, of which Yokosuka and Yokohama are part of. So I looked up uh, some of the home runs at Nigun for the past couple of years, and I did find that the Western League for the home run leaders was about at a home run rate of one every 11 games. Um, whereas in the Eastern League, it was one in every eight games. Now, these numbers need to be taken with a very serious side of salt because the sample size for each of these is very, very small. So, one in eight to 11 games, well, how does that compare to Ichigun games? And what I found is that Ichigun over the past year, home runs occur once, or for the leading home run hitters, that is, they get a home run once every 15 games. So both the Western and Eastern leagues tend to have um, higher home run rates than at Ichigun, that is, the top team, to which... I kind of still feel that 
that one statement wasn't quite on the money. However, that statement had absolutely nothing to do with the rest of his study. So the rest of his study is still very interesting. And I really recommend that you go see it. I'll be posting links to the um, posts under the uh, broadcast here. So that was one of his studies. And another one of his studies was about uh, Dr. Nigun Prospects. And what I found fascinating about this is that it does really help to explain some of Rakhtin's off-season purchases. For example, Andrew Jones, even before his behavioral issues at Christmas, uh, many people on a couple of forums were kind of suggesting that he didn't quite have the temperament necessary to do well in Japan. So I think that his Christmas display of uh, some violence, let's say, um, well, let's say alleged violence, um, is just being brushed aside by the Eagles because, as um, Holsey points out, the Eagles don't really have much on the farm for coming up. So they're really banking on having a excellent foreign batter to come in and get a lot of the job done. Also, they acquired 42-year-old former Yokohama Bay star pitcher Takashi Saito, who has been throwing in the major leagues the past couple of years. The Eagles are very much looking for some change at Ichigun. And I think that Holsey's report really does show why that is that they're going out of their way to bring in a lot of talent. And, of course, this goes back to last year, too, bringing over uh, three returning Japanese from the major leagues. Um it really does put a perspective on things going on with the Eagles. So I very much thank Hulsey for his reports, and I look forward to more Nigun reports in the future, and I am definitely going to start paying more attention to what's going on on the farm here in Japan. Thanks a great deal to these very fascinating, interesting reports. Batting third tonight is Dan Nomura. Dan Nomura was on a radio program on January 3rd this year, and while this wasn't really covered in the English press, at least not to the best of my knowledge, um, there was a little article in Nikon Sports which um, had a few quotes from his radio interview. So I'd like to first read some of those quotes and then talk about them a bit. So regarding the players' associations between Japan and Major League Baseball, Dan Nomura says, and this is my very loose translation, in the case of Japan, the Players Association is weak. It doesn't function as an organization. By not showing an attitude of pressuring one's superiors, management isn't going to move. And about the Major League Players Association. With a steep salary jump, the players become one with management, and there is the feeling of unity throughout baseball as a result. Sources of income increase, and stimulation occurs. Okay. And Dan Nomura concluded, Up to now, I thought that it was management that was bad. However, it's the player's problem if they aren't trying to reform. 
So Dan Nomura is basically trying to say that by having player salaries rise, they are able to become equal with the club owners and everyone becomes a big happy family. At least that's kind of the impression I got from this uh, interview. Um, and I couldn't help but think that he doesn't really understand the concept of causation. Okay? Number one, player salaries go up. That means costs go up, yes? And if costs go up, then... Um, Sources of income increase and stimulation occurs are his words. Um, in Japanese, shunyugen ga fue kaseka shtekuru. If you've got another translation for that, I'd really like to hear it because I don't see how the jump in player salaries is necessarily going to stimulate new sources of income. I can, of course, see that new sources of income will become desperately needed, but here in Japan, those have been desperately needed for some time now. So I don't really think that player salaries rising is going to magically cause more sources of income to come into play. However, I do think that this kind of harkens back to the first um, segment on this podcast where the NPB commissioner could, if he had any power at all, could start to promote Japanese baseball overseas. Now, this is going to have to, again... See, the owner's willing to share, and I just don't see it happening anytime soon. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that Dan Nomura does have some good points in here, but I don't think that just having a more powerful players union um, is going to magically create more revenue streams. Um, that's a uh, kind of, what is it, a straw man argument? Set one thing up and say that it'll cause the other? No, that's, that's just not how it's going to work, I don't think. Um, but I do think that a stronger players union would be good for baseball. And of course, a stronger commissioner would also be very beneficial. So... He's kind of there, but uh, I think that the only people who are going to benefit from uh, the players making more money are player agents, like Dan Nomura. Batting fourth tonight is John E. Gibson. I've gotten word from Gibson's son that the first 2013 podcast for Japan Baseball Weekly is going to be on January 14th, a week from tomorrow, based on when this podcast comes out. So the Japan Baseball Weekly podcast will then follow every two weeks through the end of January. So I guess we can call it Japan Baseball Bi-Weekly until March. And and uh, also, on the upcoming schedule, the Tokyo chapter of Sabre will be meeting on January 19th at Shiba no Tori Ichidai. That is near JR Tamachi Station in Tokyo, or via the Tokyo subway, Mita or Asakusa lines at Mita Station. And that wraps up the second episode of the Proyaku Record. I'd like to thank you for joining me, 
And if you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. And if you would like to help donate to the broadcast, you may do so via PayPal at westbaystars at markjapanesebaseball.com. Take care.